Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Why don't we start with your uh, background? Where did you come from? Uh, what have you done uh, up till today? And what are you working on now? Sure. Well, uh, probably most relevant for this. So I um, I came to Washington um, actually about 10 years ago in, in the late summer of 2011 uh, as an intern uh, in the Senate. Um, I was a, an intern uh, in a program uh, that was um, started by former Oklahoma Senator uh, Fred Harris. He represented uh, Oklahoma in the US Senate uh, the late 1960s, early 70s, uh, and then ran for president a couple of times. But um, he was a, a, also a professor uh, at the University of New Mexico where I went. And uh, we had a program where students were placed in one of our congressional delegation offices um, for a semester. And um, I sent, spent the semester uh, in the office of now retired uh, US Senator Jeff Bingaman, um, who was in the Senate for 30 years um, from 1983 to 2013, um, and was had a really great internship experience and actually had been planning to kind of, uh, after I was done with that, I was going to be finishing my last semester of undergrad and plan to apply to PhD programs and eventually do political science research. Um, what I found, you know, over that four or five months was that I actually really liked the work that goes on on Capitol Hill and, and um, kind of wanted to stick around and um, closing Senate office very often. There's a, there's a lot of upward mobility and, and opportunities. And um, he, he had about a year left in his term at that point, And I um, was hired to, to work for him. So I ended up um, spending about a year on, on his staff where I just, you know, um, tried as much as I could to be a sponge uh, for the sort of collective institutional knowledge and experience that really had built up in that office over 30 years. Um, and, um, you know, found myself wanting to, to stay in the Senate. I, um, when Senator Bingaman retired, went to work for uh, Tom Udall, who now also is retired, who represented New Mexico in the, in the Senate um, for 12 years. Um, and, um, you know, over that time that I both interned and worked on Capitol Hill, um, you know, I really was interested in a lot of the, the institutional workings, right, like the rules, um, procedures, uh, culture and norms, um, you know, how the Senate actually worked and how the Congress worked. Uh, and, and probably that had a lot to do just with my, my um, you know, political science um, background and someone who was actually really interested in studying politics um, sort of uh, from an academic perspective. Um, you know, so I, I was sort of always balancing uh, these two, um, I guess, competing uh, sort of um, approaches to the work that I was doing, which was sort of considering things in kind of an institutional perspective, but also there was sort of the practical um, policy and, and political um, approach as well. And that, you know, I, I worked for members um, of Congress who, who had um, things that they wanted to accomplish and things they wanted to, to do. So, um, you know, for the, the time period that I was there, 2011 uh, to late 2014, um, you know, really, um, was a, I think, high point in terms of Senate kind of uh, dysfunction and gridlock. Um, you know, it was really when tensions were, were growing uh, in the lead up to um, Democrats kind of going for the, the first nuclear option under Majority Leader uh, Reid and eliminating it on most nominees. Um, and and um, my boss in particular, and this was something that I worked with him on, um, was a, um, a probably I would say a lead senator at the time um, around the idea of, of reforming the filibuster. And, and um, we, we actually got um, a, a vote on his filibuster reform proposals at the beginning of the 113th Congress. Um, and, and it really did not gain a lot of support. Um, but about 10 months later, uh, the caucus had really <laughs> changed its position uh, and, and we were you know, um, using the nuclear option to, to change Senate precedents. So I um, felt very, fairly fortunate that I, I lived through kind of this, I, I think a, a important period in, in time in terms of what was going on in the Senate. Um, but, you know, by the time I, um, you know, 
late 2014, a, a series of things were going on. I, I was um, working on issues that had gotten a lot of attention and, and really drained me kind of for the two years that um, prior, which was I was working on um, rules reform in the Senate. Um, I was working on immigration and I was working on gun control, all of which uh, were sort of major um, weeks, if not months long issues that we worked on in that 113th Congress. Um, and I, frankly, like a lot of staff, I mean, I was burned out. I wanted to do something else and um, had an opportunity to come to the Bipartisan Policy Center where I've been since 2014 um, to work on kind of two sets of issues that are really near and dear to my heart, um, voting and election reform and, and the one we're talking about today, which is um, reforming Congress, um, making Congress a better performing um, institution. Um, and so since that time, I've worked on just a number of different projects, um, trying to, to bring that about, um, bring about um, even just a, uh, an environment where people in Washington are interested in talking about those issues. So um, that's sort of my um, background and, and uh, at least relevant to what we're talking about today. So what's the breakdown of your time between you know, more the electoral stuff and the, uh, and the real Congress nitty gritty? I'm probably about 50 50. Um, although, you know, I, I joke around a lot. It's probably closer to 55 55. Um, you know, it, it, some of it ebbs and flows. Um, you know, there, there have been years where our um, election work has, has not, um, you know, been um, as um, sort of rapidly evolving. Um, and then there are years like 2020 where um, you know, you, were in, in our case, most of our work is with state and local election officials. We actually um, have not done a lot of work at the federal level, which is sort of where a lot of the attention is now, or at least it is an unusual period of attention on it now. Um, but we spent a lot of 2020 working with people, particularly ones we already had a lot of relationships with, but state and local election officials, uh, trying to just prepare them for the madness that was uh, 2020. Got it. Well, let's talk about the, the congressional work that you're doing. I mean, obviously, the, you probably touch a lot of different parts of Congress. I know that you have a, a kind of an index um, about, uh, I guess you call it the Healthy Congress Index. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing there and what you're measuring and how that index came about and where, what you see is good about it and where does it need to continue to evolve? Yeah, happy to. So, our Healthy Congress Index is something BPC launched in, in 2015. And the genesis of it really was uh, BPC had um, in 2014 just um, wrapped up um, a commission on political reform. Uh, this was um, sort of one of our uh, traditional BPC uh, commission. Um, I think we had somewhere near 30 commissioners from a lot of different backgrounds. We had former um, members of Congress, we had former cabinet secretaries, um, we had election officials, we had people from the business community, um, nonprofit leaders, um, really a lot of different um, walks of life, but the unifying, um, you know, theme being, um, you know, uh, accepting that the United States um, is polarized in terms of our politics, how do you um, create a blueprint um, for you know, carrying out our democracy and governing through that. Um, and that commission, you know, it was headed by um, Trent Lott and Tom Daschle, uh, Olympia Snow, um, and Dan Glickman. Um, and a, a third of, of what that commission really focused on was reforming Congress. Maybe not surprising because certainly more than a third of the members of the commission were former members of Congress themselves. Um, but you know, I, I think the commission identified one that we had serious challenges in our election system uh, that undermined our democracy, uh, particularly a theme that I think is only intensified now, which is, um, you know, that both sides, I think, see the other side as attempting to sort of rig the rules um, in, in their own favor. Um, you know, the, the second part was that Congress just really was a dysfunctional um, institution. Um, and, and some of that, of course, was an effect of um, the polarization we are seeing. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and then our third part was about community and national service. Um, on, on 
you know, congressional reforms, a lot of what um, the commission identified um, was a breakdown in what had been sort of the normal operating procedures in Congress uh, during a period where Congress was um, fairly productive um, and, and suffered certainly from much less gridlock than we see today. Um, and so, um, you know, what the commission concluded um, was that, you know, yes, you know, Congress is polarized and probably that polarization has a lot to do with why we've gotten away from what a lot of people call, you know, regular order. Um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about what we think of as regular order. But um, the commission's point was that, you know, yes, polarization might be driving um, the interests of each party away from adhering to regular order because it's much easier to um, enact your own policy goals when you do that. Um, but that, um, really doing the hard work actually of, of adhering to a regular order um, is, is something that can help us navigate through polarization um, rather than be you know, dysfunctional because of it. Uh, so what, what do we mean by regular order? What the, the commission really focused in on was, was a lot of, some of it was normative, um, but those norms were really wrapped up in rules and procedure. But uh, the commission really felt like members of Congress weren't spending very much time in Washington anymore. Um, that, you know, there was a, a growing trend of members um, who didn't want to be seen to have, you know, quote unquote, gone Washington or um, gotten Potomac fever or however you want to look at it. Um, but basically there, there's a trend um, that still holds today where members, um, you know, try to spend as much time as they can in their district um, rather than in Washington, which was a real departure, um, you know, from the period of the 40s uh, up, up through the 80s and really mid 90s. Um, but the members felt like what was lost there was not just the time they could be spending doing their work, which they felt was important that Congress actually has less time to do their, their work, which is, you know, part of the reason that they are often sort of missing deadlines and kicking the can down the road. Um, but that members had really lost opportunities to build relationships with each other because of that. And um, relationship building, you know, they saw as, a, as key to legislating. Um, the other parts of it really had to do with how Congress does its work. And so, um, you know, a big part of it was the committee process, the breakdown um, of committees as, as sort of, um, you know, being the... Um, <clears throat> you know, the lab bench, if you will, um, you know, for developing policy, um, you know, before it comes to the full chamber to be considered. Uh, I sort of think as, of committees as, as being like an on-ramp, you know, to, to, to the highway of the, of the floor. Um, you know, the, the process there uh, with committees is, is supposed to be um, one of fact-finding, of dialogue, um, it's supposed to be um, about finding consensus and figuring out, um, you know, what are the problems uh, and what are the best solutions that we can agree to. The commission was concerned that, um, you know, something that I, I think a problem that has only intensified, and unfortunately that's been the case for almost all the metrics uh, in, in our index, but, um, you know, that committees had really been replaced by a process that was mostly uh, controlled by leadership or negotiated outside of the committee, um, you know, sort of forum. Um, and so legislation now, um, you know, legislative language is often drafted by leadership. Um, you see, um, you know, that major legislation, things, you know, like an infrastructure package or, um, you know, the, um, you know, recent uh, American um, Rescue Act, a uh, number of, I mean, really big bills that spend very little time in, in front of committee, except maybe in a sort of pro forma way. Um, and that has a number of really bad effects. I mean, one of them just being that um, it, it doesn't give a lot of members a whole lot to do. Um, it doesn't really build any, uh, um, you know, support for legislation at, at the committee level. Um, but it also just tends to reflect what are the much more sort of political views of, of party leaders um, rather than reflecting sort of the consensus uh, 
the collective views of the members who make up the, the committee of jurisdiction. Um, you know, the a couple of other areas that um, they were concerned about had to do with the, the floor process. Um, in the House uh, and the Senate, they were just concerned that um, you know, the amendment process um, really had broken down and it's only continued to break down since 2014. Um, you know, we've, the last two Congresses we've had have, have been the worst um, for the number of amendments that members um, had considered in the Senate. Um, and, and the House is, is also at, at record lows um, as well. Um, and we think, again, those are really critical points for um, rank and file members to, to participate. And that's what their job is, is to come to Washington and um, have their constituents' views aired. And certainly the amendment process is one way of doing that to try to impact legislation, to impact outcomes. Um, in the Senate, there, there was a concern and certainly, you know, now here we are, uh, you know, half a decade plus later, uh, still talking about this, but that <clears throat> the, the filibuster had really, um, you know, become both weaponized, um, but also, um, <clears throat> you know, that that was tied to the amendment process in, in the Senate. So, um, you know, there was a concern that the filibuster was being deployed far too often by the minority to block legislation. Um, but that also one of the reasons the minority did that um, was at the time we were really in the beginning stages of what I call this amendment drought in the Senate, um, which was that the majority leader just wasn't allowing amendments to be offered. Uh, and so in retaliation, um, the minority would threaten to or, or would filibuster. Um, and um, the other area that we were concerned with um, primarily was, was conference committees, which we certainly were not the first, um, but I, I think we're one of the, maybe one of the last people who continue to raise a concern that um, conference committees really had become rare. And so, you know, a conference committee is, is, is historically um, been um, the primary way that legislation passed by the House and Senate, um, you know, the differences between those would be resolved. Um, and, and again, that was a, another um, forum that was really more um, about deliberation uh, and finding consensus among members rather than being driven um, by, you know, negotiating back and forth between leadership, um, which is what you get now, um, when instead of using a conference committee, um, the chambers just you know engage in what's called ping pong and they just send the bill back and forth um, until they can all agree on a version that is the same. Um, and and so what I think most of these really add up to um, is you know um, <clears throat> a decline in Congress's ability and willingness uh, to deliberate on issues. Um, you know that's probably the defining um you know breakdown in, in congress um of, of the last you know decade or two um and it's really i think you know it's something that you're you're interested in right which is um it, it's a breakdown in an ability to collectively make decisions and solve problems so for the index that you've created how is it calculated how is it uh and what is it telling us yeah, so the, the index does is, is try to measure um, a number of these things over time. And so, you know, what we looked at was, you know, whether con the number of days Congress spent really working in Washington and, and whether they were living up to the standard our commission came up with, which was a, a five day work week, um, whether um, committees were really actively working and reporting legislation. Um, how often amendments were being allowed in the House and Senate, how often um, you know, cloture had to be um, an attempt to invoke cloture or end to filibuster to move forward on legislation, and how often conference committees were being used um, to resolve differences. Because what we found was it's really hard uh, to hold Congress accountable for a better process without um, you know, a really consistent view into how things 
um, either used to be done or could be done, right? From Congress to Congress and, and um, in the case, in what is often the case, leader to leader, it's very hard to kind of track these things. Um, you know, you sort of get caught up more in the, in the day to day rather than um, systematically, you know, trying to identify a pattern. Um, and so, you know, we, um, you know, basically, um, you know, uh, I'll start with the first one on, on working days. Um, we, you know, have a, <clears throat> a sort of methodology there that we've determined of what sort of, uh, you know, accounts for a, a real working day, you know, whether there was some sort of um, legislative business and, and whether they spent at least an hour in session. Um, and, and we, you know, have literally gone through the congressional record for every day that Congress is, is in session, I think since uh, 2008 um, to, to identify that. Um, you know, and, and some of the other data, um, you know, is not, um, these aren't entirely new measures that we came up with, but we, what we felt like was um, bringing them together in, in one index um, really gives you just a more holistic view of, of the breakdown of what are really interrelated, um, um, you know, mechanisms in Congress. So, um, you know, in terms of, of committees, um, you know, we started looking at over time, how, you know, how many um, bills committees were reporting um, and on, on amendments in, in the House, um, we threw um, uh, Don Wolfensberger, who is a, a fellow with us, um, you know, have been um, tracking um, special rules, which are, are basically the rules by which a bill gets considered on, on the House floor. They can be open, which means any number of amendments are allowed. Um, they can be, um, you know, closed, um, which means, um, you know, that um, no amendments are allowed at all on the floor. Um, or, you know, in the alternative, they're, they're sort of in, in, in between where, um, you know, the House Rules Committee determines which amendments are going to be considered and which ones aren't. A really important thing there is it's, it's sort of a scale, right, of, of is it sort of an open freewheeling process or is it a closed process or somewhere in between. Um, you know, in the Senate, we just started looking at raw numbers of, you know, when how many amendments was the Senate considering um, and, and found that a, a fairly easy thing um, to look at um, and track. Um, and, and really, it's, it's mostly just been a, a big decline um, over the period. Um, and in terms of um, the filibuster, um, we, um, you know, admittedly, it's, it's a fairly difficult thing. I think everyone would, who studies it would say um, to come up with what is, you know, a really um, foolproof measure of when a filibuster has or has not occurred. Um, we um, have tended to go with, um, you know, I, I think, um, uh, cloture votes, um, sort of based on a theory, um, you know, that um, Sarah Binder, you know, um, proposed quite a while ago, just about, um, you know, the idea that um, Senate leaders will mostly try to avoid a cloture vote if they can. Now, I mean, increasingly, that's almost impossible on everything. But um, so uh, looking at cloture votes really probably is, is one of the more accurate ways we have to look at um, what I think is, is the fundamental question there, which is, is does the Senate ha have or is it lacking agreement on whether or not to move forward um, on a piece of legislation? And in terms of conference committees, again, we, we kept it you know, pretty basic, which was just looking really at um, you know, the raw numbers of, I mean, how often is a conference committee being used to resolve differences on major legislation? Um, and so, um, you know, uh, I, I, there have been some small blips of hope at times uh, in these um, measures. Um, we um, tend to track, or, or we have in the past, we, we sort of recently moved to an annual um, update, but we used to update the data quarterly, which kind of gave us an in real time view of, you know, where the trends were going in Congress. Um, but um, in, in basically all of these ways, Congress has, has been, 
stagnant um, or, or um, in decline away from ways we'd want to see the trends going. Um, one interesting exception has been um, on, on committees, um, which is, you know, sort of committee activity, which we've really just um, since um, 2014 seen a real uptick in committee um, activity. Um, the interesting thing being that um, we, we don't measure this or there are sort of independent measures and we've thought about updating the index to, to reflect this as well. But um, even as committees are sort of more active and reporting more bills, more of the bills that are considered on the floor are not bills that were reported by committees. So it sort of raises this question of whether committees are doing a lot of um, busy work or not um, that isn't going anywhere. Um, and you know, certainly there, there's a lot of debate there about what what happens that language and how do you measure it and does it end up in other bills? But um, you know the the major takeaway, um, and, and we did sort of a a decade report um, that we released. I want to say um, in 2018, um, where um, we we kind of um, rather than doing a, a quarterly update, did a, a um, look across a, a 10 year span. Um, sorry, we released in 2019, it, it covered 2008 to 2018. Um, but um, we, what we found over that period, and these trends have, have just continued is that, um, you know, the index has shown a real decline in in regular order, which we, we think of as Congress's ability, at least as anyone has so far conceived of it, you know, to engage in collective, um, you know, decision making, problem solving, um, over time. Well, let's move on to a, another subject, which I I know that you have some thoughts on, which is this concept of, and maybe the bipartisan policy centers involved in, which is this, you know, having a forum for groups of with different interests to to discuss things in a more private setting versus on camera. Right. I mean, a lot of people point to the cameras as being a major reason why there's less compromise, there's less um, ability, you know, less meeting of minds, right? Because they're always on display and whenever they that happens, they have to go into showmanship mode. So can you talk a little bit about your perspective on, you know, privacy versus kind of transparency when it comes to what Congress is doing and where one works or the other works best uh, and where that should be located in Congress? Yeah, I, I think um, what we BPC would say, and, and I personally, you know, is that um, in Congress sort of went too far with transparency. Um, you know, perhaps, you know, the, I, I think it um, is often sort of simplified to, you know, they brought cameras in and that kind of ruined everything. And I, I, I don't know if that, that evidence is right, but I, I think what has happened um, is just that um, we, as a society, I think are much more aware of, of sort of the day-to-day -day ongoings um, because of, you know, the sort of rise really of, um, or expansion of, of media coverage and uh, social media. Um, you know, Congress is just on display much more than it has ever been. Um, I, you know, I think, um, we might not be facing the same challenges if you know we were living in a an alternate universe, perhaps where Congress had just brought cameras in, but you know social media never happened, and twenty four hour cable news never happened, and um, a number of other developments. But um, I think what has happened is that Congress um, brought about a certain level of transparency that became really difficult to maintain um, in, in the world that we are are in. Um, and, you know, just as a, a simple explanation of that, uh, you know, at the committee level, um, it, it's pretty rare now, and, and this is not all caused, I want to say, by the attention that they're getting, but, um, you know, almost all of the work, you know, that would typically go on behind the scenes, um, you know, whether it's members, uh, you know, used to attend briefings together. They used to, um, there used to be questioning and, and meetings with potential witnesses and experts behind the scenes. There were um, all kinds of activities that led up to something like a markup or a hearing that 
for the most part doesn't happen in committees anymore. Um, and those were really opportunities where members could, um, you know, in a, a genuine non-rehearsed way uh, and perhaps in a vulnerable way, ask questions and explore, um, you know, uh, issues. A lot of that really doesn't exist anymore. And, and some of that is um, just because of the really tense uh, nature of the relationship between the parties. I don't think there's a large appetite for that, um, you know, particularly on committees where there's much less um, agreement um, or there's um, a, a wider gap between the, the members of the two parties. Um, but it, it, it's pretty rare that you have a um, sort of more a quiet behind the scenes process uh, that involves members and staff that leads to a public you know, uh, event like a hearing or a markup, and that leads to sort of a, a floor process. Um, you know, I think that there's a balance to be struck. Um, and there's nothing really that would prevent Congress from doing those sorts of things now. Um, I think, you know, there's a there's a limit to how much you could roll back transparency or would want to. I think Congress is always going to need to, at some point, stand up publicly, right, and, and defend, for, make its decisions and defend them. Um, you know, so I think a, a shorthand um, that we're very comfortable with at BPC is, is you can negotiate in private, um, but you have to defend it in public. Um, you know, I don't think we want a situation to go back to a world where, um, you know, congressional committees meet and conduct business without the public present or without press. Um, that, that's just not going to happen. But um, what Congress does need to get itself back into is a habit of doing some of that preparatory work um, that really needs to happen, um, doing that ahead of time um, before you're ever in front of the cameras in the committee hearing room. And, and I think we've seen that practiced a lot by the, the House Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. Um, and I think that's that served them well. And some committees do this, this better than others. But um, you know, there are real challenges um, with a process that is entirely open um, and, you know, constantly scrutinized. Um, and that is that, um, you know, one, you, you just sort of, you know, you have an, a, a section of, of members or a cross section of members who um, have um, very difficult reelection prospects, let's say. Um, and so their um, um, incentives are you know, not to do anything in a public setting that is going to upset that um, one way or another. I think that can manifest a lot of different ways. Um, but we also have the rise, I think, as, as attention on Congress has grown, um, of something that um, Yuval Levin at the American Enterprise Institute um, has really highlighted, um, which is that members really sort of have this sort of celebrity seeking instinct now. Um, you know, you have a lot more show horses than workhorses, maybe than there ever were. Um, but I do think there's a, a sense among members that you have to be a show horse just to survive. And so I think um, probably all members are, for the most part, you know, 90 something percent of members are um, doing much more um, show horse um, type activities than workhorse ones. Um, and so um, that, um, you know, instinct among members um, that whether it's, you know, a sense that, you know, it's easier to get reelected if you're getting attention from, you know, the, the media aligned with your parties or on social media, whether it's easier to raise money, um, whether it just builds you a national profile to run for some other office. Um, you know, that instinct um, really has become the primary, a primary driver of member behavior um, and it incentivizes some members, right, to, to behave maybe in a particularly disruptive way uh, to try to gain attention. Um, and so um, without any processes really that, that occur um, outside of, you know, public scrutiny, um, you're, you're really left with a lot of um, bad incentives uh, for behavior uh, that, that tend to upend things. And I think that's why um, partially um, leadership has um, moved to this, this um, process where they negotiate things in, in 
among themselves, among the, the party leaders, um, or among a party's leaders in a small subsection of its members, uh, and then you know basically make it public and tell their members to vote for it because that reduces uh, the opportunity for something to derail legislation from moving forward. Um, and um, political scientists um, James Curry and Francis Lee have really identified this, and I, I don't think they are um, wrong in that they, they've identified that. Um, I, I think their supposition is that regular order really maybe can't work right now just because of the, the nature of the parties. And I, I think they, they could be right about that and that we still should want something like regular order to be viable to solve the country's problems to or to identify the country's problems and come up with solutions. I mean, right now we, we don't even necessarily let alone solutions. So but, sorry, but it sounds like um, when we talk about privacy versus transparency, um, you don't see a rollback of the existing transparency as being uh, the way to go, but you do see some of the work of committees, particularly in the preparatory work before markups or whatever, some of that kind of work could be private. And if that were the case, that that would increase the productivity of the institution. Is that right? I think it could. I mean, you know, Congress is always facing uh, a number of um, challenges that are that are going to make its work difficult. And it's always a question of, of what can overcome all of those, which is increasingly very few things. Um, you know, it, um, members could, and I think very often, do agree on, on problems and solutions in private. And it's a question of whether or not those are going to be brought forward publicly, um, or is a party going to choose to um, you know, put forward a, a bill that it might know is not going to pass, but pleases its voters. Um, but I, I think in situations where you have a real viable opportunity um, for uh, consensus building, where the two parties agree that, yes, we want to do something on this issue and we're willing, you know, to negotiate over it uh, and come up with a solution together, then that's the sort of process that really does need to have um, at least some portion of it uh, take place outside of, of public scrutiny. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, there are any number of, um, you know, sort of traps waiting for them if, if, if you just go about the whole process publicly. But um, another part of this, I, I think probably if congressional staffers or members were, were listening to this, they might say, well, we do that. Um, you know, we, we have lots of meetings um, that, aren't, that aren't public. And I think that's true. But I think increasingly those meetings are, are not with the other party or with interest groups from the other party. Um, and so they, they tend to be very one-sided conversations rather than ones that are, are meant to, um, you know, build consensus um, within the committee. So I, I think, um, yes, it's going to be very hard to roll back um, what is already there. Um, but I think a, um, an attempt to um, go about things differently Again, I, I think what we are aiming for is, is how do you govern through this difficult period that our, our politics are in, not how do you, um, you know, end it? Because I, I don't know that there's any process in Congress you could change that is going to end our political polarization because that's not where it comes from necessarily. Um, and so if, if your goal is, is how do you govern through a period of really high polarization, partisan polarization, then um, th that's the sort of thing that could help. There's, there's a lot of other things that um, have, don't really have anything to do directly with um, you know, legislating um, that we also think could help that, that should go on outside of public view for the most part. Um, and a lot of that has to do with relationship building. Um, you know, more and more congressional staff and members just don't have the kind of working relationships that you need um, to legislate. Members don't know each other as well as maybe they, they once did. Um, that seems to be reflected in, in um, some qualitative research, uh, particularly some done by the Association of Former Members of Congress. Um, and so I'll, I'll shamelessly plug here one, one program BPC um, pioneered is something called the American Congressional Exchange. We have bipartisan pairs of members visit with each other um, in each other's home districts for a weekend. 
Um, and that's an opportunity to build a relationship that is um, outside of what we call sort of the crucible of, of Washington, um, you know, that, um, you know, is really, again, um, a much more private, although it's not totally private. We, we do a lot of the events are in public. They're at businesses and hospitals and military installations, universities. But um, those are opportunities that really what we're talking about, I, I think, is more stepping away, you know, from the Klieg lights um, and, and being real, um, you know, people but uh, colleagues and, and less performers. <laughs>